ways to do without number 10. Meet Alex and Donna Vucinas. They met at work and fell in love. Aww. She was from Florida and he was from Canada. Just days before they got married, Alex was looking through some of Donna's childhood photos and stumbled across this one of her posing at Disneyland with her brothers. Alex looked closely in the background and oh my god, he realized the man in the background was his own father and the boy he was pushing was him. What? That is unbelievable. They were from different countries, but somehow ended up in the same childhood picture together 20 years before they married at Disneyland as kids. Is that fate? Is that fate? I think that's fate. At number nine, we have the Mandela effect. You might have heard of this. This is where people misremember something from the past. Now, people misremembering things happens all the time. What's the big deal? But the Mandela effect is literally thousands of people remembering it a different way. It's called the Mandela effect because there are thousands of people, maybe even millions, who remember Nelson Mandela dying in the 80s. But he didn't die in the 80s. This dude lived until he was an old man. Or am I remembering it wrong? Are the other people right? The reason why this could be proof of a simulation is because these slight mistakes could show some sort of human error or a glitch in the system on the side of the people who are running the simulation. Someone sat down on the wrong button and was like, oh, I killed Nelson Mandela. I'm going to get written up for this for sure. God damn, that wasn't supposed to happen. At number eight, we have Deja Vu. If you haven't seen The Matrix, then what are you doing with your life? It's not only one of the most amazing movies that showcases what could happen if AI gets out of control, but it also is one of the greatest action movies of all time. And there's a fourth one coming, so you need to catch up on everything. Now, The Matrix was one of the first movies to showcase the simulation idea. And evidence of The Matrix or something changing in The Matrix was deja vu. If you saw something repeat itself, it meant that you were in the simulation and that things were about to get crazy. Now, how does this translate to the real world? What if The Matrix wasn't so much a movie, but it was a message? What if the people outside of the simulation wanted us to figure it out and see if any people would use the hints laid throughout the movie as a way to actually break free from this digital prison? There could be clues throughout that movie that showcase all the signs of us being in a world of ones and zeros. Either that, I'm starting to look like Charlie from It Was Always Sunny with the strings and paper, and I'm like, eh. At number seven, we have simulation loop. We are already starting to see what is called a simulation loop. We live in a simulated society. Many things we create are larger versions of smaller things. Planes are simulations of birds. Tanks are simulations of beetles. As we create what we think is better versions of what already exists. Now, we could be getting close to a loop of creating a world which is more interesting than our own. Virtual reality has started to take the world by storm and in it we will build worlds that are far more superior to our own. Worlds where people can fly, everyone is rich, you don't get sick and everyone can res their buddy because they got the ray gun. Now some people theorize that we have done this before and we are currently living in a previously created simulation and we might be headed into another loop in the near future and go into a simulation again. So it's like simulation on simulation, inception, in simulation. Oh, I'm not gonna work on that. I made that word up, I'm sorry. At number six, we have the double slit experiment. This was an experiment where you take a panel of copper plate with two slits in it and then you fire electrons at it to see how the electrons interact on the other side. Do they move through in waves or particles? The first time this experiment was performed, the electrons seemed as though they were moving through in particles. The scientists wanted to see this in action, so they set up a device to observe this. And when the electrons were under observation, they moved in waves. So they did the test again without the observation and they went back to particles, meaning that the electrons would change how they interacted based on whether or not they were being observed. If this was a simulation, much like a video game, the processing power would increase on certain areas when you were looking at them, which would explain how this changed the electron activity. Obviously, it's probably a lot smarter explanation than that, but I'm going with the simulation one because I am not smart. At number five, we have Elon Musk said so. Come on, you can't argue with this dude. He's one of the smartest, richest people around. If anyone knew we were in a simulation, it would be this guy. He probably sees the matrix all the time. He just doesn't want to freak us out by letting us know that there is a 100% chance we are in a simulation by letting us know that there's a 100% chance we are in a simulation. Also, if anyone was on the up and up on whether or not we are in a simulation, it would be billionaires. Not because they paid someone to figure it out, but because they clearly have cracked some sort of code and know how the world works and are doing something we don't understand 
understand. If you had that kind of knowledge, you would be able to get ahead in the game. But Elon has made the theory of a simulation world so popular, so is he our digital messiah, or is he just a little bit crazy and has a lot of money? At number four, we have that's why we have ghosts. Now this seems like I'm trying to explain a myth with a crazy explanation, but that is why you guys come here. We want to get a little crazy with our theories because that is way more fun. Just walking around in our own reality, we don't want to do that, jeez. But what if ghosts and hauntings have nothing to do with ghosts, but they are glitchy parts of our own reality? Like a haunted house is just basically Fallout 76. Ghosts are floating around doing the T-pose, freaking everyone out. Demons, werewolves, all that sort of spooky stuff that we've always heard about. Myths, monsters, and creatures that could all kill us. That's just DLC that the public didn't like and then they just patched it out. And number three, we have creative purpose theory. Why do we exist? Some people think it's to serve God. Other people think it's just to have fun. Other people think there is no purpose at all. That we just live and die to get farted out into the earth and never heard from again. But what if we had a much greater purpose? To create. To make something so smart and so interesting we couldn't bear to compete with it. As we get closer and closer to making AI, it seems that a self-aware, learning, adapting intelligence that has the power of the internet in its mind would be too much for us to compete with. It would be a living god that we made and we should be pretty proud of ourselves for doing it. But what if that is our purpose? To make a being that is all knowing and able to move through the universe, consume knowledge and become even more powerful all without needing to eat, sleep, procreate or even take breaks. What if we already did this and now we're living inside this endless machine and the only reason it keeps us alive in this falsified world is because it wants to keep learning from us. Well, if that's the case, download me some abs because it's almost beach season. At number two, we have computer viruses for people. DNA is a type of code, much like the code that makes up computers. So could a virus from a computer get into someone's DNA somehow? Most of you probably think that is impossible, but there was a group at the University of Washington who might prove you wrong. Now, I want to start off by saying you can't get sick from a computer. The virus that got put into human DNA cannot affect people. Don't freak out. But in 2017, this group found out that you could put malware into a strand of DNA. It was a very interesting experiment and it might have worked because all of our DNA is actually code and we are actually made up of ones and zeros and nothing's real. Ah, go rob someone. Don't actually do that. And for our number one spot, we have the Fibonacci sequence. This is gonna be some math stuff, so if you guys aren't good at math, don't worry, because I suck at math too, and I had to find a dumbed down explanation so I could understand it, and I'm gonna be bringing you an even dumber version right out of my mouth. The Fibonacci sequence is a series of numbers where the totals equal the numbers before added together. So starting with zero, we have zero plus one equals one. One plus two equals three, two plus three equals five, three plus five equals eight, and so on and so forth, with the sequence looking like zero, one, one, two, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, and it goes on like that forever. Now, what does this have to do with simulation? Well, this sequence shows up in a lot of math and also a lot of nature. Many plants and other natural forming things have perfect Fibonacci sequences inside of them, almost like they were programmed from a computer. This could just be the most efficient way to make life and cells are living math, or could we all be in an auto create version of life and that's how the world is built in a computer and it's just like boop they hit a button and it makes everything. At number 10 we have the Fermi paradox. This theory has some holes but it is still very interesting so it was a perfect way to start out this list. We live in a universe that spans an unfathomable distance and has so many planets in them you couldn't count them even if you were really good at counting. So some of them are much older than ours so that means that their life would be way more advanced. So why on earth have we never heard of any of these aliens, why have they not come out of the stars to see us? Well, this could be because we have a government that is hiding them from us, or it could be because we are in a simulated world and there's no benefit to simulating life on other planets. That could mean that the processing power and whatever we're hooked up to just isn't strong enough. We need to get a rig that is way better if we wanted some alien life to come in. We've got to invest in a new like graphics card and stuff. Coming in at number nine, we have There's My Wife. 
When do you think you're gonna meet your soulmate? Well, for some of us, it's never gonna happen, so stop waiting and start getting really good at Call of Duty or something, because it's going to be a lonely existence. But for some other people, they might have already met the person that they're going to spend the rest of their life with, but they just don't know it yet. This was the very situation that happened to Amy Maiden and Nick Wheeler. The two of them are married now, but right before they were set to elope, they decided that they would go through some old family photos. Most of them were probably a nice hit of nostalgia, as most most family photos are, but there was one that was particularly interesting. There was one of Nick on a summer vacation with his family when he was a kid. He was on the beach with his brothers and sisters, and in the background of the photo is Amy. What? the hell? How is this possible? Is one of them a time traveler who was sent back in time to rewrite history by falling in love with the other? Well, no, it wasn't that sinister. Actually, Nick's family was on vacation in the town where Amy grew up, and it just so happens that Amy was on the beach at that exact moment. Sort of romantic, but also kinda weird. Coming in at number 8, we have Anthony Hopkins needs something to read. We live in the golden age of literature. Anything you want to read, you can find in a second. You you can just look it up on Google and half the time you don't even need to pay for it because you can just steal it off the internet. But things weren't always this easy. When Anthony Hopkins was cast in the movie A Girl from Petrova, he wanted to be the best actor he could possibly be by finding a copy of the book so he could have a good idea of what the movie was going to be like before he was in it. But he couldn't find the book anywhere. Randomly, he found it on a train sitting in an empty booth. When he was finally on set for the movie, the director of the movie asked him if he could borrow a copy of the book because he had left his on a train. That's a weird spooky connection right there. Coming in at number 7, we have the twin link. That has been a question for a long time. Do twins have some sort of neural link that lets them share thoughts and ideas? Does sharing a womb make you connected to someone forever in a way that cannot be explained yet by science? Well, no matter what your opinion is on this, this story is very strange. James Lewis and James Springer had a very strange thing happen to them when they were 39 years old. They found out that they had been separated at birth and were twins. Their mother gave up the two babies and they ended up in different homes. The weird thing is they both ended up with the name James. Then later in life they both became police officers. Both of their second wives were named Betty. Both of them had a son who they also named James and they both had a dog named Toy. Now in the infinite universe maybe this is just par for the course. And there's nothing going on here other than a roll of the die hitting the same number over and over. Or maybe twins are actually connected through some sort of psychic force. Coming in at number 6 we have My Buddy Umberto. Alright, this one is super freaky and I'll give you the whole story, but for it we have to travel back to the year 1900 on the day of July 28th. This was the day before the King of Italy, Umberto I, was assassinated. I would never want to be king because it seems like everyone is just trying to kill you all the time. Well on this day Umberto went to a restaurant to hang out and get a little food and he met a dude who looked just like him. He went up and talked to this guy and it turns out that this guy was born on the same day as him in the same town. They were both married to ladies named Margarita and on the day Umberto became king was the day that this dude opened his restaurant. Whoa, that's a little freaky. Well, the next day Umberto was assassinated and guess what? The restaurant owner was also killed. Coming in at number 5, we have the twin theory continues. We are getting even deeper into the wild world of twins. Is there some sort of connection or was our next set of twins just the two most unlucky dudes to ever share a womb? Arthur and John Moford ended up in a hospital at the same time. These guys were twins and they ended up in the same hospital and they were both having heart attacks. They would die around the same time. Dude, if I had a twin, I would be like, you better be healthy. I don't need my good heart crapping out because you love Doritos. Coming in at number 4, we have Robert Fallon's best hand. Robert Fallon was on a hot streak in a poker game back in 1968. He was playing with some mobsters and it turns out that they didn't trust he was just lucky, so they killed him on the spot, accusing him of cheating. Now, they didn't want to split up the money, but they also didn't want to stop the game, so they got a new guy to come in and play. This new dude was now on an even better hot streak and eventually the mobsters told him what happened and he realized that the guy who was killed was his absentee father who had been missing since he was a kid. Coming in at number 3 we have Mark Twain pulls up Babe Ruth. Calling your shots comes in all shapes and sizes and with Mark Twain it came in the form of calling out when he would die. That's a power of your own destiny that most people could never imagine. Mark Twain was born when the Halley's Comet passed by the earth in 1835 and if you know the Halley's Comet you will know that it comes around every 75 years like clockwork. When the next passing of the comet was coming through Mark stated that he came with the comet and he will die with the comet. And just like that when the comet passed 
cast, so did Mark Twain. Coming in at number 2 we have The Tyranny Curse. This is one of the strangest coincidences I could find. This is all tied to the construction of the Hoover Dam. The thing is, the scouting and construction of the dam spanned from the 1920s into the 1930s and a lot of people died in the process. The first person who died was a guy named J.G. Tyranny and the last guy who died was Patrick Tyranny. The spooky thing is that Patrick was J.G.'s son. So their deaths were the opening and closing ceremonies for the dam in the darkest way. Coming in at the number one spot we have the narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym of Nantucket. This is a famous book by Edgar Allan Poe and it's about a boat that sinks and then a bunch of people on board get stranded and they have to eat one person from the boat. A pretty grim story and it should be no surprise coming from Poe. But here's the thing. 46 years after this book came out, a boat by the same name went down and the people on board got stranded and they were forced to eat someone on board who was named Richard Parker. Now the crazy thing about this is the person who got eaten in EAP's book was also named Richard Parker. Yeah, that's kind of freaky. Coming in at number 10 we have that sinking feeling. How many accidents out at sea do you have to have before you realize that you should never go on a boat again? For whatever reason there are some people who will never have a good time out on the ocean so you might want to find a job that doesn't have anything to do with H2O. Well Violet Jessup was working as a nurse in 1911 and she was primarily on ocean cruisers. Her first accident at sea was when the boat she was on board of crashed into another boat. Luckily she was able to make it onto one of the lifeboats and get out without a scratch. Now she probably thought that that was just bad luck and what better way to circumvent bad luck than by going on a boat that was apparently unsinkable. Yes, the next year she got a job on the Titanic. Well that stinks and I think we all know what happened there. Again Violet was able to make it out without a scratch. After that you would think I am never going on a boat again but a girl's gotta work so there was no slowing her down. The final incident was on board of the HMS Britannic. The boat hit a mine and was going under. This time she wouldn't be so lucky. She was able to make it out alive but while escaping the sinking boat on a lifeboat, the lifeboat got sucked into the moving propellers of the Britannic and Violet received a serious blow to the head. But like I said, she lived, probably never to go out to sea again. Coming in at number 9 we have the story of a 70 year old man from Finland. In 2002 he was riding his bike in a snowstorm in the town of Rahe when he was sadly hit and killed by a truck. It was a tragic and rare occurrence but just 2 hours later another man was hit and killed by a truck while cycling less than a mile down the road. That man was his twin brother. Police said it was unlikely that the second twin had even heard about his brother's death before he died the exact same way. The first officer on the scene said that when she heard the 70 year olds were twin brothers it made the hair on her back stand on end. Blah, creepy. Next up at number 8, Dr. Peter Scott was the co founder of the Loch Ness Phenomena Investigation Bureau. Their aim was to identify the legendary creature known as the Loch Ness Monster. Now, Dr. Peter Scott wanted to make sure that whatever was lurking beneath the waters there could be protected as an endangered species, but first he needed to give it a proper Latin name for it to be registered. He called it this Nessitaris Rombop. Terex. Now the word came from ancient Greek and mean the monster of Ness with the diamond shaped fin. But not long after this announcement a journalist with a bit too much time on their hands I think decided to unscramble the letters and they realised they were a perfect anagram of the phrase monster hoax by Sir Peter S. What? That's pretty mental right, come on. Can anyone explain that? Can any of you guys explain that? I don't care about all the Nessie pictures out there, you don't need to explain that, just explain this one for me. Next up at number 7 we have the incredible story of the Jim Twins. In 1940 twin boys were separated at birth in Ohio and adopted by separate families. When they finally tracked each other down at the age of 37 they found out that they had both been named Jim. But oh, the weirdness was just getting started. Jim and Jim both had childhood dogs that they named Toy. When they grew up, they both married women called Linda. They both then divorced their respective Lindas and remarried women who were both called Betty. They both had a son who they have both named James Allen. They both got tension headaches, smoked the same brand of cigarettes, drove the same model of car, and went to the same part of Florida for their vacation. And the list goes. Goes on. I think they're both wondering why the other one had to copy them so hard. Like, dude, can you just get your own life, Jim, and stop? 
copying mine, Jim. Number 6. In 1975, the Royal Gazette paper of Bermuda reported that a man called Erskine Eben had been hit and killed by a taxi as he drove his moped. What was crazy about this though was that Erskine's brother had died a year before too. He was killed on the exact same moped. He was hit by the exact same taxi with the exact same taxi driver and here's the real kicker. He was carrying the exact same passenger in the back both times. Whoa! I'm personally surprised the police didn't arrest that passenger because he might have been some sort of like genius murderer who kills his victims with like taxis. Next up at number 5, we're going back to Detroit in 1937 where a street sweeper named Joseph Figlock was out, you know, sweeping the streets when a baby fell out of the sky and hit him on the head and shoulder. The baby had fallen from the fourth story of a nearby building and likely would have been killed if Joseph was not there to stop the fall. That was strange, but Joseph carried on with his life for another year, but then while out sweeping a completely different street, another baby landed on him from a nearby building. Again, Again, it hit Joseph on the head and again the baby survived. This guy was like the strangest superhero of all time, saving babies with the power of his cushiony head. And now at number 4, in the 1920s there were 3 Englishmen on a train in Peru. They were all travelling separately and had never met each other and were already pretty surprised that there were 3 English guys on a train together on the other side of the world. Then they introduced each other. The first man's surname was Bingham. The second man's surname was Powell. The third man raised his eyebrows in shock and announced to the other two that his surname was Bingham Powell. Whoa, the chances of that happening are mental. At number 3 now, we have the story of Michael Dick from England who wanted to get in touch with his daughter Lisa who he had not seen for 10 years after splitting up with his wife and moving away from his home. He tried everything but when all else failed he asked for some help from a local newspaper. They took this picture you're seeing now for the article. Amazingly, Lisa saw the article but before she could get in touch she realised something incredible. She saw herself in the background of the photo photo with her mother. They had actually taken a picture just there moments before and were walking away when Michael took this picture. The very person he was trying to look for after 10 years was in the photo he used to find her. I bet that's going to be a very important family photo. Coming in at number 2, in 1914 a German mother took a picture of her newborn son to be developed in Strasbourg but before she could collect it, World War 1 broke out. The woman had to leave the picture there and considered it lost forever. Then two years later she was in Frankfurt, over 100 miles away and now she had a new baby girl. Again she went to get a picture of her daughter developed but when she got it back she was quite annoyed to see that her had been some sort of double exposure with someone else's picture in the background. It wasn't someone else's picture, it was her picture of her son that she took two years before over 100 miles away that had somehow ended up in a different store, marked unused and had been sold back to her where she then put another picture of another child of hers on top of it. <sighs> And finally at number 1, we're going back to 1899 where a man was struck and killed by lightning while standing in his backyard in Taranto, Italy. That's incredibly unlucky, the chances of that happening are very low, but guess what? 30 years later in 1929 his son was also killed by lightning in the exact same place. Okay. That's crazy right? That is crazy. A father and a son from the same family being killed by lightning in the same place. What are the chances of that? Well, 20 years after that, on October 8th 1949, a man called Rolla Primada was also killed by lightning on exactly the same spot. He was the son of the second victim and grandson of the first. Incredible. I'm seriously wondering if that family was like made out of metal or something because nobody should attract lightning that much. Thank you.